What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Zero to Diamond podcast. I'm your host, Ricky Carruth. I'm on a mission to help reduce the failure rate in the real estate industry by helping you master your skills on the phone, conquer your fears, and changing your mindset. Now, let's get into the show. What's up, Zero to Diamond Nation? Welcome to this week's show. Today, we got Joshua Smith in the house. What's up, man? How are you? What's up, brother? It's good to see you again, man. It's been a minute. Absolutely. absolutely. I'll give you guys a little bit of backstory that uh, Joshua doesn't even know. I watched a video of his, uh, probably your most watched video, uh, the one where you did the little speech in the classroom with the, uh, uh, you know, 90 days, double your business or whatever. I watched that like two years ago, right? And then, and then, and that was when I was actually trying to like be a better agent. You know, I was like trying to figure out how to sell more properties. Then I got into coaching about a year ago. I come on your show and dude, you look so different from that video to now. Um, I did until after the podcast that I did with you, I didn't even realize that was the same person. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things. You know, I always look back at, you know, the great Jim Rohn and he always, yeah, you know, he he would uh, when he was on stage talk about like he sharpening your axe and always improving your skill set. And he's like, I don't want to be the guy where they're like, oh man, I, I saw Jim Rohn speak five years ago. It was so amazing. He's like, I want to be that guy where like, oh, I heard Jim Rohn speak five years ago, and now I heard him today, and holy shit, you know, right? So you know, right. just like you're doing man, it's it's just you know sharpening that axe every single day, and and. I'm investing more time and I'm trying to get to Warren, Warren Buffett's level. Well, eventually, hopefully the, the wealth level, but right now to a self-development level and Warren yeah. Buffett's six hours every single day in self-development. So I'm up to about four right now and I'm just more so than I've ever been. Man. I have more coaches and you know, I'm spending uh, this year, you know, with, with the trajectory I have right now, should be about 150 grand just coaching for myself this year um, that I'm investing in just yes, more time and more money than ever before in my self-development, dude. Good Lord. So you got, so you got how many coaches? So I've got uh, uh, three that are like full time, one on one, high level, high access. Um, and then numerous that are parts of the program, you know, like Lewis Howes, mentor mine, I'm at his inner circle. And that's where I learned yeah. webinars from was Lewis Howes. And yeah, you know, I'm with uh, Russell, Fr uh, you know, Russell Brunson's Click Funnel University. And um, um, you know, I mean, it's, at any given time, I'm probably in three or four different digital platforms and mm -hmm. I'm actually working with two different consulting agencies right now, which I don't really know if you want to call that a coach, but there's an element to coaching there, right? Um, you know, I mean, they're implementing for me and, and helping them improve, but, uh, you know, I'm observing and learning. So hopefully my team can take these skill sets that we're learning from them too. So, and then, and then obviously just, are you reading a lot? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, not as much as I used to. Um, I actually don't read any books anymore. I'm at my home office right now. I got this library behind me, all these books I used to read. Now I just listen to books, dude. So yeah. just make it easier to, to, to integrate, right? So, so I'm like doing my daily cardio or whatever. I've always got a book going on. Like right now, those that are watching, listening, I don't know if you've, you've listened to this, uh, uh, Ricky, but um, Ray Dalio's Principles. Uh -huh. It will blow your fucking mind. So Ray Dalio is the most successful hedge fund uh, manager ever to exist on the planet, you know, right? And, um, you know, 100 of the top richest guys on the planet. He's ranked by, by Fortune as one of the most influential uh, entrepreneurs ever on the planet. And, like, this is a guy that uh, economy leaders have come out and consult them on the whole entire economy. And this Principles book, dude, what's up, Rich? Um, so, uh, uh, principles, what I love about it is it's not just about hedge fund trading and different trading. Um, you know, it's, it's his thought processes and he brings in his principles from life and business on how he operates, how his mind works, how it thinks, you know, so it, you don't have to be like, I don't, I don't personally invest in paper assets in the stock market at all. Right. So, you know, you could be a guy like me that could care less about paper assets and still gain so much out of the book. But, um, yeah, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, I listen to probably about 45 minutes a day to audiobooks because anytime I'm in the car or whatever, which is as minimal as possible. Um, but most of it is, yeah, coaches and, and actual digital digital platforms that I'm watching on a daily basis at this point. Man, that is so interesting to have somebody at your level who is still spending so much money and time and energy on his personal self-development, coaches, so on and so forth. Now, that is uh, that's, That should be an eye-opener for a lot of people who uh, watch this video. 
Yeah, dude. So, so you know, Warren Buffett was interviewed uh, a while back, and mm. dude interviewing him, Warren Buffett was talking about how he spent six hours a day in self development. The guy interviewing him is like, uh, "Man, you spend six hours in self development. It's only twenty four hours a day. Like, how the hell do you do that?" And he goes, "He goes, um, well, well, you may have heard recently that I bought a, a company. Maybe you heard of them. The company's called Coca Cola." And he's like, have you heard of Coca-Cola? And everybody's like, yeah, of course. And he goes, um, you know why I bought Coca-Cola? And the dude's like, no. And he goes, well, they sell like 4 million bottles of Coca-Cola a day, right? The leadership was perfect. The, the culture was perfect. The formulation was perfect. I didn't have to do a thing other than I raised the each each uh, Coke can or bottle or whatever by one penny. It's like, can you imagine what that did to my net worth? And he goes, you know why I was able to buy Coca-Cola? And the interviewer's like, no. He goes, because I self-developed for six hours in a day. The average human being, when they're making a decision, they're making it off of the information that they have in their brain, right? And he goes, I have six hours a day of self-development compounded over, you know, 50 years that he's been following the strategy to go out there and make these decisions. And dude, like, you want to get to the next level, you know, the game I'm trying to get to and play you know, right? Um, like you, you got to what, what got me to where I am will never get me to where I want to go. I must. Sure, you know, sure. I, I, it's not a doing process. Success is not a doing process. It's a becoming process. Right. So I got to become that human being first. And the only way to really do that is just add more shit into this. This guy up here. Right. I love it. I love it man. Uh, OK, for the, for the few people out of all the people watching who don't know, everybody that's watching this should know who you are. But for the few people who don't, give us just a little bit of backstory, kind of like where, where you kind of came from, a little struggle, how you overcame it, what you're up to today. Ah, uh, dude. So um, got in the business in 2005 into real estate. That's where I got my start as an entrepreneur. Um, jumped into the industry never to stay in the industry, right? I mean, my, my, I grew up in the health club space and that was my dream. And I'm 23 years old. I want to go out there and open up my own facility. It's going to cost 800 grand, but I'm a college dropout with a thousand bucks in my bank and shitty credit, right? So couldn't get a loan. So I'm like, all right, I got to go raise some capital, at least enough capital where the bank or some investors might take me seriously to help fund the rest. And, um, real estate, 2005 markets on fire. Everybody I know that's in the, in the space is making a shit ton of money. So I'm like, all right, this is it. I'll go in here, just work my ass off for a few years, raise the capital, um, and uh, got in the business, just crushed it my first year, did 48 sales in my first year. Now, I tell people that because people are always like, oh, my God, how did you do that? I'm like, look, every human being with a freaking pulse, at least in Phoenix, Arizona, was selling so much real estate. Like, I didn't even get rookie of the year, right, if that puts that into context, right? So, yeah. um, you know, but what that quickly did is that taught me about capacities. You know, right? So I did 48 deals. Now you got to understand 2005, there was no YouTube, there was no Facebook, like shit like we're doing right now didn't exist. Like I was using my Razor flip phone, right? Um, scanners were just coming out, right? So we were still fax and meet with clients. There's no docking okay. size. Capacities were lower. So I wanted to go out there. I mean, to still hit my end because because at that time I still wanted to, I wasn't in love with real estate. It was still just a means to an end for me. Um, and uh, I needed to double my business the next year to, to, come even near close to, to raising the capital they needed to raise. But I couldn't fathom how to even add an extra transaction to 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 you know to my business a month, right? I mean I was working four a.m. to midnight, just grinding like crazy. And uh, so it forced me to start a team. So like after 12 months in the business, I hired my first assistant and several months after that, I, you know, built up uh, about 18 months in the business, I should say, built up to, to six buyers agents. And that's when I fell in love with the business. You know, right? Um, I realized I could have a bigger impact in real estate, make more money in real estate, but just have a bigger impact on others' lives. And it wasn't by working with buyers and sellers, it was through my teammates. And I'm like, look, I could teach these people how to go out there and create true, you know, true wealth in their life, uh, um, have a big impact that way. And then I also took in, you know, a lot of the health and fitness practices and taught them just to how to go out there and have a great life, you know, right? Make more money than they ever made before, have better relationships with the family than ever before, be in the best shape of their life. And that's when I truly became obsessed with real estate. Um, so we started growing the team. You know, we were doing, you know, about 300 deals a year um, right before the market crashed. So we were one of the top residential teams in the country. Market crashes. Now, luckily, I was still young enough and, and naive enough. I shouldn't say naive enough. Uh, I was naive, but I guess that had nothing to do with what happened next. But I, I, I didn't, I wasn't set my old ways. It's like every single day I was still having to come into the office, pull out that blank piece of paper and reinvent myself. So when the market crashed, I didn't have bad habits. I wasn't set my ways. So we were able to transition very, I shouldn't say very easy, but 
it was an easier process than a lot of people, right? Um, through into short sales, REOs, got into that space, and then of course transitioned out. So uh, 2017, um, just to give people some context, my team did 653 uh, homes, uh, home closings at 3.5 million GCI. I stepped out of production about four years ago, so I don't sell real estate anymore. I haven't sold a house in four years. I just operate as a team leader. Um, about a year ago, I brought on a CEO. So now I'm totally detached, right? I mean, I probably spend 20 minutes a month in, inside that business and I focus on other businesses. Um, you know, as far as struggles, dude, I mean, this would be a 18 hour long podcast to go through so many of these, these struggles. There's this huge myth, like dudes, people might see guys like you just out there crushing it and put you on this pedestal and do what you've created is insane, but they don't see all those struggles. You know, right. Um, I know those that are watching this have heard your story. I've had you on my podcast. I've heard your story, you know, right. But to create success, man, you feel exponentially more than you ever succeed. And man, I've made it. I've lost it. You know, I've, I've uh, lost my life savings. I've had to put myself in hundred thousand dollars of business credit card debt just to survive. I've owed, you know, 40 plus thousand dollars in, in back taxes that I came short on paying Had to refinance houses just to, you know, come up with the capital. I mean, this business has been so amazing to me. So I, I thank God I didn't quit, but there's probably been a good dozen different times where I was on the verge to where it kicked the shit out of me so hard. But the blessing is if you just keep pushing hard, right. And you reflect on those moments, you know, pain and power really, really come from the same place and using those pain, painful moments will become your greatest assets. You know, uh, um, if you allow them to do so like putting yourself. So imagine this dude, the year before I did 1.2 million in commissions. Now my real estate business was still going good. I mean, what year was this? This was uh, shit. What was this? Like 2000? It would have been 2011. No, okay. 2000, like 12, 2013 area. It was about five years ago. So okay. um, whatever. I can't do math, but um, um. I made some other really bad investments um, and, and got myself in a hole in some other other areas outside of my real estate business, but it all, it all affected each other, right? So lost my whole entire life savings, which at the time was about 300 grand of, of tax-free money that I paid tax on the bank. Um, but again, in order to just survive, I had to put myself in $100,000 of business credit card debt. And at that time, I'd be like, I'm hawking my like Rolex, you know, I right? used to pay my mortgage payment because I also had two houses. So I had half a million dollars in mortgage debt. I had two car leases, like at $2,200 a month in car leases, and I had no fucking money. I was in the hole 100 grand and trying to figure that out, dude. That way, it took me 18 months to come out of that hole, and it was so much pain. And at the time, you know, you don't realize it, but dude, that was one of the greatest experiences that's ever happened because it taught me I don't worship money, but I respect the hell out of it. And now I pay attention on such, such a deep level, dude. It's, it's you know, that, that painful moment changed every aspect of my life. Oh yeah, no doubt, man. When I lost everything and I uh, had to go back to roofing houses and working on the oil rig, you better believe that was the best thing that ever happened to me, dude. Because there was there was 40, 50 year old guys right next to me going through the same thing, and I, I was in my mid twenties. And I and I when I went through when you when you went through that struggle, did you know that that was one of the greatest things that ever happened to you during this during that time? Not, not, not initially, but one of the things that I would say, guys, that, you know, I mean, the first thing that got me pushing through it was, I guess there was two things. Number one was ego, right? Like ego can be negative and, but ego can also be good. Where I was like, dude, I cannot, I can't quit. I can't refuse. I can't be that guy, right? Like I can't, like I was freaking out about the stories that people would tell because dude, I'm still at that still time. I'm still speaking on stages. And I'm like this guy. And I'm like, I can't be known as the fucking laughing stock. Right. Uh -huh. so ego was, was a big part of it. Number two, you know, I knew that I created success, you know, it came from nothing. I created success in the first place. So I knew I could recreate. I knew I just made some bad decisions and I could re go out there and recreate it. Um, um, but what really pushed me through those, those deepest, darkest times was studying the greats, you know, right? Like a, a book that I read about a half a dozen times while I was going through that is Ashley Vance's Elon Musk, um, which is a brilliant book. Everybody should read that. And you look at Elon Musk, right? So he sells PayPal, gets like 225 million out of the sale, invests every single cent in SpaceX, Tesla, Solar City, um, but then loses it all. Like loses it all to the point where he forecloses on his house, his wife leaves him, takes his kids, he's freaking living on his buddy's couch, and he's about ready to lose all the companies and file bankruptcy. And like at the twelfth hour, dude, he gets a call from a venture capitalist that has faith in him that refunds, you know, funds him and fuses capital. Uh, but if it was a venture capitalist, he would have been done, right? Um, 
but then now, you know, the dude is, I mean, I don't even know his net worth now, they 20 billion or whatever. Yeah. But, but when you put it into retrospect, I'm like, dude, what I'm experiencing is nothing compared to what these, these guys are. And what I learned through that moment from studying the greats, when I was studying the greats, I was studying greats that experienced insane amounts of pain. And it was like, dude, um, one commonality that I see that every uber successful person has, if, if there is such a thing as, as a superpower, it is to endure extreme levels of pain. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so at that point, I was like, okay, I got to be able to endure pain to succeed. You got to be able to last. And, and every successful person I've ever studied that self made has went through insane pain. But at that point, then as I started studying them, then I realized, you know, that I, I was going to learn the, a massive lesson out of this and sort of reflecting deeply on what those lessons were. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's an incredible story, man. And, and like you say, every successful, super successful person has went through the same exact thing to one one way or another. So um, what do you think the best advice was you ever got? Shit, dude. Uh, I mean, I've never been stumped on a question in my life, I don't think. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, I mean. One one of the I'll say one of the most impactful pieces of advice I ever got was uh, was one of my mentors comes to me um, and says to me, he goes, Josh, you know the difference between you and I? And I'm like, no, what? And he goes, um, you're trying to prove to the world that you're wealthy and I'm actually wealthy. Um, and he was right. Like it, it, it was like a dagger, you know, right? But he was right. And this, this guy is a guy that's, you know, um, worth several hundred millions of dollars, is CEO of a, a multi billion dollar a year annual revenue company. And, um, but he was right. And he goes to me, he goes, if you want to, if you want to truly become a player and truly go out there and create massive wealth, you've got to learn to operate on 10% of your income, right? And then invest the rest, right? Like you see, you know, he's got the planes and the cars, like you see all this sexy stuff now, but it was two decades of making sacrifices, you know, right? That, um, I, that allowed all these things to happen before that, man. I mean, I was spending money left and right as, as quick as I can make. I was saving a little, you know, right? But yeah. nothing where I needed to be. And, you know, now I've got myself to, I operate off a 5% of my personal um, income. Um, like the house I live in right now, dude, I mean, I make more in a month than I paid for this house. And, you know, I bought it as a foreclosure, bottom of the market. I have teammates drive the nicer cars than I do and live in a nicer homes, even though I might, like, you know, 10 or 20 times the income that they do. Um, but that was probably as far as a piece of advice that, that made me truly wake up and, and I followed, you know, right. Um, that made a massive difference. Um, you know, that, that's had the biggest impact on my wealth is just, just, you know, thank you God that he shared that info with me. No, dude, that is, that's beautiful, man. That's, that, I'm a, that's where probably where I'm at. I probably, I probably live off five or 10%. Yeah. I'm putting everything else back into the business, man. How long have you been, uh, doing the GSD? Um, shit, about three years now, dude, we kicked off the podcast. So it was, I think it was like January 1st of 2015. Um, so kick that off. When I first started, it was going to be called keeping it real in real estate with Joshua Smith. <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I hired this webinar company because at that same point, uh, same point, I'm, um, um, you know, starting to do webinars because at that, I started, I just started the boot camp at that same time. Yeah, really, I yeah. kind of started the podcast. I mean, I wanted to go out there and have an impact and give back because I know that not everyone watches the podcast, very small percent will ever buy the boot camp, but it was a platform to go out there and also promote that. Um, so I hired this webinar company. I paid him like 15 grand, designed my first webinar and helped me go out there and promote it. So the next day I had like 600 people sign up for this webinar. They still hadn't delivered it to me. Right. Um, so I didn't have it. And I had like these 600 people waiting. So at the middle of the night, you know, right, I go out there and I write a post on Facebook kind of about the experience. I didn't name the company. I didn't throw them on the bus or anything negative like that. But I was like, what happens when you're in this situation? I'm like, you pull an all nighter, and you, you know, you make it happen and you get shit done. And I was like, hashtag GSD mode for life. And it just kind of stuck, dude. Like a couple months later, I had a speaking gig and people were like, oh, get shit done. You know, because I started using the hashtags. The post ended up getting just a, a lot of traction. Then um, then my wife gets me for my birthday. You know, and this is again right before we were launching the podcast. We actually had recorded a bunch of content, you know, before we, we started the podcast just so we had some stuff in the bucket and we had to rebrand everything. So she bought me, a, uh, made a, a GSD mode shirt and a GSD mode hat. And again, it started creating traction. So I'm like, fuck it, dude. Like, you know, I was, I was actually really nervous, dude, to go and get shit done, um, GSD mode. Cause I'm like, you know, what are some of these guests going to think? And it has, like, we've had some guests that have seen it. They're like, look, dude, this is, you know, maybe they have different views. They don't swear or whatever. And, and, yeah. you know, had instances where, where it's, 
you know, hurt us. But yeah, it's about three, just over three years strong now. That's awesome, man. Guys, we're live with Joshua Smith. This is a live Q&A. If you guys have any questions for me or Joshua, I'm live on Instagram as well. Um, so just type a question in if you have any questions for us. I got a question for you about YouTube. Um, you don't, your, your channel's not monetized, right? Right. And I think, I think monetizing is kind of a, a path to, to growing your channel. Um, you know, YouTube kind of helps you there if you're monetized, push it out to more people and reach more viewers. I mean, I know you don't like the channel, the, the ad running at the beginning of the videos. Is that the reason why you don't monetize? You just don't want that ad running across the front of your yeah, videos? That's where, I mean, I'm not like some massive YouTuber, you know, right? I mean, if I was getting, you know, 8 million downloads a month, I might reconsider it. But we're, you know, we're, I don't know, 50, 60 downloads a month on YouTube alone. And um, I, I start off monetizing it. I think our biggest month we made like 600 bucks, you know, right? And I'm like, yeah. all right, it creates a shitty user experience in my opinion. I know I freaking hate seeing the ads. Um, yeah. I'm just like, dude, it, just like the podcast, right? I mean, I only have my own companies. You know, I've got nine companies today and I have my own products and companies sponsoring it. So, you know, that, that's been our path. I mean, I don't know if it's the right way or the wrong way. That's just been our choice is, is, you know, create a better user experience and then any ads that we do run or pop-ups that we have or just our own products and what we do. So Michael Seth Seville here wants to know how we're dealing with Facebook ads. I know we're both crushing it with Facebook ads, but maybe touch on Facebook ads for a second, your experience and kind of what's working. Yeah, so um, I do a lot of Facebook ads as well. I, uh, nine grand a month is my current budget. Um, average cost per lead is around $3.30 a lead. Um, our conversion ratios with, with Facebook leads, it's, it's, we got a 1.2% conversion overall conversion ratio. So that's one out of 85 leads, right? Which is a 21 X gross return. Um, so the, the conversion rates may be lower than like an open house, you know, but the, the return dude, I mean, my average commission, now this is just Facebook ads alone per on, on closings from our Facebook ads is $6,005. Um, so that's about $248 or whatever to go out there and, so I stick 248 in this ATM and it spits out 6,000 back to me, right? Um, so um, yeah, no, we're 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 do you know crushing as much as we possibly can with them. Um, now, with that being said, um, as far as the, the the type of ads that we're running is all lead ads at this point. That's what we're having by far the best success. Um, you know, I've had a lot of success with conversion ads and other style of ads, but what I love about lead ads is you get everybody's full complete name, full complete phone number, full complete email, and the data is typically accurate, right? Because the lead ads, those of you don't know what they are, is Facebook opts them in for you instead of sending your website where you have to opt them in. Well, the, the human psychology is, dude, we already give everything to Facebook. We trust Facebook. It's there on Facebook, so they're more likely to opt in. Plus, any of that information they have on their profile uh, uh, page, it auto-fills it, you know, right? So the data is much more accurate, um, and... Uh, yeah, so in, inside my ISA department, two full-time ISAs that all they're doing all day long is, is following up these leads, setting appointments for my agents. Um, but all we're doing, like there's two things I do right now in my business, right? Facebook ads and uh, open houses, and we're just crushing with both of them. So you spend 9000 a month on just real estate Facebook ads. Yeah, yeah, I spend about another 50000 a month on the other stuff. But yeah, just 9000 <laughs> just, just Facebook, yeah, but just for my real estate business. Shit. All right, let's see. Now, and I want you guys to understand too, with Facebook leads, because I, like, I'll get asked this question all the time. Like, hey, Josh, I'm an individual agent. H how much should I be spending on Facebook ads? <laughs> well, you got to understand, just like direct mail, geographic farming, or any really any other medium that you're going to go after, there there is a lag time before you start seeing those results. Your average Facebook uh, consumer or, or real estate client is 6.7 months out from wanting to meet with real estate agents. You know, so yeah, I mean, if you're doing high enough volume, you're going to get some immediate clients out of the gate, um, but it's going to be about six or seven months before you start seeing good, consistent business coming from that lead source. So the most important thing is pick a budget, whether that's a hundred bucks a month or a thousand bucks a month or whatever it is that you're like, hey, I can invest this and afford to lose this. Like if, if I don't get the ROI, you know, and I have to walk away, it sucks, but I can afford it um, or afford to not make any money at this and do this consistently month after month after month after month without making the ROI, you know, right? For at least six months. I mean, you got to plan on that. I mean, if you've read Napoleon Hill's uh, Think and Grow Rich, right? He talks about that story in there of, of stopping three feet short of gold. And this is yeah. what most people say do, whatever it is. 
you know, right? Um, whether you're doing like with what you do with Ricky with circle prospecting or open houses or Zillow leads or Facebook leads, you know, right? They give you a shake for 30 days. They don't take enough effort and action. And they're like, oh, fuck, it's not working, right? It's, mm-hmm. there's, only, there's only one magic pill that exists in life and it's consistency. So you got to be consistent with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I say, everything works, like everything, you know, Facebook ads, open houses, Zillow, circle prospecting for sale by owner expired, uh, door knocking. It all works. You just got to do it. Yep. Everything works and nothing doesn't, right? <laughs> That's it. So uh, Rich wants to know, what's the biggest challenges you see coming in real estate, coming in, in real estate or changes, changes that you think need to happen? Yeah, so um, I mean, it, the the quickest change that I foresee coming is a market correction. You know, right? Um, when the second lar- longest bull market in recorded history, what always falls a bull market is a market correction. Now, how severe? I don't know. The economy is a much much worse standpoint or stance overall than it was before the start of the last recession. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're like we're sitting at like twenty three percent true unemployment rate right now. You have nine hundred thousand less jobs than we had before the start of the last economy. Um, 40% of, of Americans are in student loan debt, 50% now are in medical debt, 72 month auto loans are all time highs, you know, so I don't think it'll be real estate that leads to crash like the last crash. Um, it'll probably be medical and, and student tuition debt that cause you also have record high median, uh, uh, middle-class income drops. Like people are just making less and less money. And it's because we're now witnessing the de-industrialization de- of the economy, right? During the industrial age, so if you look at during the industrial revolution with Carnegie, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, all those brilliant people then, all the elites, the middle class had to exist for them to accomplish what they need to accomplish. Today, the middle class does not, it, it doesn't do anything for the elites. It doesn't serve them, right? Everything can be outsourced or done in different methods now. So you're seeing the deindustrialization where you're going to see the middle class just dissolve. It's just, it's just a natural thing that's going to happen. Um, and, uh, so, so number one, a correction is coming, you know, then, um, you know, the biggest change I see overall in the real estate game is, you know, we're already seeing it, but I think uh, the, the brokerage model that exists is just in, in another decade is going to look night and day from what it does today. The brokerage model as far as the uh, the, bro- the brokerage and the agents? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I don't think that's how, how agents do business with the consumer will necessarily change so much. But, yeah, I mean, bricks and mortar, you know, I mean, if you look at it, like if, you, if we compare it to other companies, Right, like Walmart is not going to exist for indefinitely. I, I I don't have a time frame. I'm not going to predict a time frame, um, but they their model is unsustainable. Amazon's going to put them out of business, and and then you got Walmart with all its bricks and mortars. They they can't transition. They can't shift. Right, they're they're stuck. So, um, and you got a lot of brokers that at this point. That's why we see. I'm not with EXP, but that's why we see companies like EXP. These you know virtual platforms or hybrids of of these that are that are becoming you know so attractive. Um, yeah, so and, and then I think dude, and we're already seeing this, but more and more independent brokerages popping up. You know, less of you know, less we're gonna see market share, KW or you know, Remax, the, the big players out there losing market share. Um just because again, dude, it, the name doesn't fucking matter. Like when I first got in the business, it mattered if you were with Remax or Century 21. Today it doesn't matter. So why why go out there and pay this fee? Because you know, I was with Remax for nine years and I loved Remax, right? However, I got sick and tired of two people having to make money off of me, you know, right? It just didn't make sense. They brought new value to me, but I was investing so much money back into them where, you know, now I'm with the independent local brokerage. Um, you eliminate that franchise, I'm able to go out there and, and keep way more money um, of my own hardworking money. And it makes no difference to the consumer what, what brokerage you're with. Yeah. Doesn't matter where you work. It just matters how you work. Huh? Yep. That's it, man. Let's see. Do you think? Do you think uh, like technology will ever take a take a little bite out of our commission? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're already seeing it, right? Um, yeah. But you know, dude. I, okay, so so many agents wig out about these discount agents, right? I mean, number one, those of you that you see them in your area, uh, those have been the, the market for a long time. Discounters always come out of the woodwork at the the peak of the markets, right? Um, but when the market's correct and you have your average house sitting on the market for seven months, right? They need a great real estate agent that knows how to price properties, that knows how to market properties, that knows how to keep the sellers in it for the long game and, and go out there and do that. When when the market's hot, you know, anybody can go out there and put a sign in the ground and sell it in four days. And it takes almost zero skill set to go out there and do that. 
Um, uh, great agents make way more money in bad markets than they do these. I mean, an extreme seller's market is the hardest market to go out there and work. You know, so so when the market cracks, you're going to probably see some of those going away. But I mean, again, it comes back to capacities. Now, I'm not going to do it, right? But I have laid out a strategy where I'm 100% confident I could fucking just murder it at a 2,000 flat fee listing. You know, right? Listing model. Like, just just imagine this, right? So if, if I, you know, and I can, you know, being a digital marketer, you know, right? Outside of my real estate business, my other businesses, you know, these are just like, like I, I sell, uh, we'll just talk about last year, 2017. I sold $2.7 million in a product. Not one phone call, not like zero sales. Dude, it was all, the whole funnel was completely automated. You know, right? So, okay, I run an ad. Um, that, that somebody that somebody goes to that's thinking about selling their house, right? So they click on there, they watch the listing presentation online, right? Then from there, and this is all educational, right? Like, why? And again, don't freak out, you guys that are watching this. I'm not saying that I'm going to do this or, or whatever, but this is what is what could happen, and probably those that are in real estate that are smart digital marketers will probably start to take this. Um, so let's just say I run an ad. Hey, Joshua Smith, you have sold over 5,000 homes, over a billion dollars in real estate. I'm here to tell you and educate you on why you're absolutely ludicrous if you ever pay a real estate agent 6% to list your house. You know, right? And then go into education of why that works, the time frame involved, and, and then convince them and show them, though, through the listing presentation process, how if they remove my time involvement, they're still going to get the same pricing strategies, the same marketing. They're going to get the same result, the same net at the end of the day. But if they help me remove my time investment, um, um, they can save that money, right? So maybe they save six grand or whatever on the commission. So then create a piece of technology, which already exists, where they upload eight photos, right? Those get sent to me or to an assistant that runs a CMA, sends it to a CMA. I don't need to walk into a freaking property to be able to comp that house, right? Once we agree on a price, they either come into the office or we docu sign the listing agreement. Um, you know, send out the photographers. Once we get an offer, we do it all through DocuSign or they come into the office. So I never have to step foot in that property, minimize my time. So at two grand, right, especially delegating this out to assistants, I could pull this off where I would have maybe 15 or 20 minutes of my time invested where I make two grand. Now it would be a volume game, right? But it would be, in, it would, the technology, something like this would be so easy to be pulled off, right? Um, so you're going to get people that catch on to this kind of stuff. Um, and start employing it because at that point, the consumer does get the same experience, the same negotiation skill, the same everything um, with keeping a hell lot more money in their pocket, right? Today's game right now is the discounters typically discount because they don't want to take the time to sharpen their skill set to actually go get their clients more money. Right, right. Yep, yep, no, no, definitely. Definitely all that stuff. I mean, you know, there's, that's already happening with uh, certain certain companies, you know. So it's just a matter of time before they figure it all out and everything. And there's going to be a part of the market that wants that that face-to-face -face and that agent. And they might have to pay a little – you may have to get a little less commission. But there's going to be clients that want to do it digitally and some that don't. So, yeah. Yep. This uh, Colin says, Josh was the first guy I followed when I got in real estate, um, built my foundation on work. Appreciate you, GSD. Yeah, thanks for the kind words, my friend. Yeah, and th those that like freak out about like Zillow, you know, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I always get, I get this question like once a day, like what happens if Zillow becomes their own brokerage and, and how do we combat Zillow? So how we combat Zillow as an industry is not, like I think one of the worst things that we could do as an industry is pull our data and not allow Zillow to take our data, right? Because Zillow, and, and I've got some, you know, insiders that I, I somewhat have some connections with. Dude, they, they have an exit. They're, they're a brilliant motherfucking company, right? To become a, you know, multi, 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 multi billion dollar company in the short period of time that they do, like, they're smarter than us, right? It's just how it goes. So you can't tell me that they don't have an exit strategy. So the second we pull their data, that's when they become their own brokerage. Once they're in their own brokerage, Right. Then by law, they have to have access to that IDX feed for the MLS. And, and, and they ju it's just going to hinder our, 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 comp or our industry that much more. So how we combat it isn't by pulling the data. How we combat it is by just learning to become your own Zillow, doing like what you and I do, Ricky, with like we don't need Zillow in our lives because we know how to go out there and, and, and do what Zillow does for three or four bucks compared to paying them 50 bucks online. So if real estate agents want to combat these big third parties, that potentially are a threat to our organization. Like, look, you just, you've got to learn how to fish for yourself. You got to go learn how to go out there and lead generate for yourself. And today's day and age, 
it's so damn easy. Guys like you, guys like me that also offer coaching platforms, guys like my good friend Brett Rakowski that has probably the best uh, just Facebook uh, uh, um, training uh, just about Facebook, um, you know, right? Like you guys got to learn these tactics 100%. Sure, sure. Tom Pratt wants to know, do you run managed and Facebook ads yourself in-house or do you hire a company to run them? Yeah, so I ran them myself. So since 2015, I've always ran them myself. Um, you know, I've, I've spent over a million dollars of my own money on my own Facebook ads, not just for real estate, but all my own companies. So I was forced to learn it pretty hardcore. Um, I tried outsourcing to so many agencies um, and uh I just couldn't find anybody that could scale up with me and pay the same attention because we were spending big money, you know. Um, and I've, I've had months with certain launches and certain products where I'm spending 75, 80 grand in a month on Facebook ads, right? So you've got to pay attention to them daily. Um, so then about, it's been about three months now. I actually hired a full time Facebook ads manager, not outsourced, hired him. I stole him away from, he worked for this big agency and his job was, he managed all of Disney's, Disney on Ice's campaigns, $15 million campaign a year. And like, this guy's a badass. Um, he lives in Connecticut, so he works for me virtually, but he's full time for me at GSD. So he manages the Facebook ads uh, for me personally for eight of my companies. Um, and then for real estate right now, actually, we started off as one of my boot camp members, still in the, the alumni program. Um, but he just took what I teach to another level. Um, his name is Brett Rakowski. Um, um, who's a real estate agent down in Florida, but also has now a, a, a service where he runs ads for agents. And dude, you know, right? I pay him a thousand dollars a month to manage my whole entire budget of nine thousand dollars. Like, dude, that's like like for me to manage that type of campaign the way it needs to be is about fifteen hours a month. So I pay a dude, and my time's worth you know three grand an hour or whatever. So so it makes sense to outsource. And he's got more affordable programs for you guys, too. And you guys can always reach out to me if you want a connection to him. But, yeah, so now I've outsourced it all because it's just not a good use of my time. What's that guy's name? Uh, Brett R Rikowski. Yeah, if you message me, I'll give you his uh, – get, get you guys connected and all his info. And he's got, like, a freaking Facebook boot camp now. It's, like, I think it's only, like, 500 bucks. Maybe it's a little bit more than that. Somewhere between 500 1,000 where he teaches you these tactics – um and uh does does epic with it what what skills are the most important for a listing agent um all right so you got i mean the obvious things you got to know your market you got to know how to comp properties like one thing that i do dude is i pay once a year i bring in um one of the best local appraisers i pay him like 500 bucks and they do just an in-depth appraisal class to to me and my team right so it's just like hey like we want to know everything that you know, how you comp properties, what you look at, whatever, which does a lot for us, right? Because appraised value doesn't always mean market value, um, but at least, we, you know, it helps us sharpen our skill set on appraising properties and, and, and knowing market values, but also knowing exactly what great appraisers are looking at. Um, so, and those are kind of the antis, right? Like you got to know how to comp a property. You've got to know all of that. Then from there, um, Dude, you got it. You got to have your listing presentation dialed in. And when I'm sick and talking, dial it in, like master it. Right. So years ago, like I used to suck at listing presentations. I was terrible. I remember like my first few, I walked in there and I was just like showing them the card star, the paper stock of the flyers I was going to do and how they were better than them. like, I didn't know how to do a listing presentation. Right. Um, but once I realized like I got to, you know, I got to increase this uh, uh, conversion ratio before, before I got to the point, where I truly mastered my listing presentation. Now I was around a 50% uh, conversion ratio on my listing presentations. And most people that hired me was just because they liked me, you know, right? Um, wasn't because my listing presentation was dialed in. And then I got just hard, hardcore laser focused with it. Um, it got up to 92% conversion ratio. So 92% of the listing appointments I go on, I convert that I personally went on, right? Uh, and, and how I got good with that, there's a couple things, right? Number one, I role played the shit out of my listing presentation. So I didn't expect to get good by just going on listing presentations. I go on listing presentations, but then would spend three hours every single night going through my listing presentation by myself over and over and over hundreds, if not thousands of times to really sharpen that axe and get good at it. Um, then from there, I started calling expireds and any listing that I lost and, and I would get their feedback. So with listings that I lost, I call them up. So, you know, Michael that asked this question, like, Hey, Michael, Joshua Smith here. Hey, congrats on your decision. I'm not here to talk you out of, out of your decision. You made the best decision for yourself and for your family. And I congratulate you on that. Um, I'm actually looking for some constructive feedback and some advice from you. 
Um, you know, what was it about the other agent? What did they do differently? You know, where did you feel I was lacking? And again, please be brutally honest with me. This information is going to allow me to get better. Um, so then I hope, hopefully I can get better and don't lose out on future listing uh, presentations. And here's the cool thing. I got so much insane, amazing information from that, but also, when those, because a lot, most sellers, the number one mistake sellers make is choosing a real estate agent based on the recommended list price, right? And I'm always brutally honest with people up front um, of, of what that looks like. So um, a lot of those I would lose because I didn't tell them the price that they wanted to hear. So after it expired or they realized they made the wrong choice, they would call me back because they respected that decision so much. But I got really good at the listing presentations, not from the listings I won, but the listings I lost, right? Then I'd call expired listings and I would just serve it. You know, hey, I know you're getting bombarded with real estate agents begging you for your listing. I'm not here to ask you for your listing. I'm not going to, you know, beg you for like where I'm just here to just to pick your brain and survey you. And if you're willing to to just uh, uh, talk to me for a few minutes, I'll send you a ten dollar Starbucks gift card in the mail for your time. And I just pick their brain. Like, what did your agent do good? What didn't they do good? What do you feel they could have done better? Because here's the thing: you know, we jump on so many you know podcasts or trainings, which are great. You know, like podcasts like this are absolutely amazing. You know, but I realized at the time, like, shit, dude, I'm getting all my information from other real estate agents, title companies, lenders, you know, agent coaches. I'm not getting any of my information from the consumer that actually pays me. So I started going deep to the consumer and, and uh, you know, getting to know, again, what their concerns were. And then, but develop your presentation towards that, you know, right? Um, objections are always a lack of education. So a presentation exists to overcome their, their, their objections. Right. So when I'm on a listing presentation, that whole like I'm not trying to sell their house. I'm just trying to sell them that I am the best real estate professional for the job and, and convince them of that, that I can you know, help them accomplish their goals. So I got to know what's going on inside their head and build out a presentation that allows me to overcome those problems that I know that's in their head. But I can't identify those if I'm not interviewing them and, and identifying that information. Damn, man, that's a nice answer. So whenever you started calling the expires to, to, to kind of survey them on what, you know, what they were unhappy with and stuff, did you end up getting some of those listings through that yeah. process? Yeah, and, and now, now I have my, my favorite expired listing approach is my expired survey. You know, yeah. I, it's like, well, you know, Ricky, you know, I know I told you that this wasn't a, a, a you know, I'm not here to ask you for business and, and I, it's not the intention of my call. I'm going to get the Starbucks gift card and mail to you right away. You know what, based on the things that you said, you know, these are the things that I specialize in. I have guarantees on, I list those out. I'm like, look, you know, I, I don't know if you have a need and a goal of still selling, but if you do, I'm 100% confident I'm the guy for the job. You know, do you still have a need for selling? Of course, I go to the appointment. If not, find their time frame, follow up with them. Cause I got the contact information from calling them. I got their email from sending the, and their address from sending them the Starbucks gift card. And I've got a relationship. Yeah. And it, it slays it on the back end for, for acquiring listings too. Let's well, see. I got a question here about um, health and diet regimens, which I guess we could both go on about that for days, but maybe give us a real quick rundown of your uh, just daily uh, habit there with your diet and uh, regimen. Health wise, um, it's one of these things that's it's top priority for me, right? So, um, you know, because dude, you, you you can't show up in your business to be the best version of yourself. Um, you can't show up with your wife or your kids, your family, right? Um, so, but, I mean, a lot of like parents, like, oh, it's like my kids, my wife, my business, my health. I'm like, not my health, my business. You know, then my wife and my kids, which is backwards from a lot of people. But I'm like, look, if I'm not healthy, I can't go out there and be the best version of myself. Like I said, to show up. If I don't, if I don't make freaking money and I'm not taking care of my business, I can't do what I need to do as a man for my family. Right mm -hmm. now, I would, you know, of course, my kids, I'd be my wife, I'd put everything, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd give up my business if I had to for them, you know, but that's my daily priority because it's just a domino effect, right? It just makes things happen, it allows me to, to show up as the best version of myself in those areas of my life. So then with that, and just be very intentional with it. So the diet I follow, and there's actually um, a, a book out there. It's a, it's one of the businesses that I owned. Uh, two of my business partners are both writers for Ironman Magazine and both, you know, amazing in the health and fitness space and, and, and successful authors and that. But we wrote a book recently called The Metabolic Blowtorch Diet. So if you go to metabolicblowtorchdiet.com, you can get the book free. You just have to pay for shipping. Um, but that's the diet that I follow. So it's it's advanced strategy, intermittent fasting, advanced intermittent fasting strategies. So the day that I work out with weights at resistance train, those days I'm eating consistently throughout the day. Um, the days that I'm not training, I fast for um, uh, 20 hours on those days, right? So no food. So I have three days a week that I fast, um, seven days a week of cardio. 
um, you know, five, uh, four days a week in the gym. Um, but intermittent fasting has been a game changer, right? So in your, your gut, your gut biome, the, the gut is the future of healthcare. I don't know if you guys know. I mean, the gut's the second brain, right? That's what it's referred to in the medical, the medical, uh, uh, you know, space. And there's as many near, there's almost as many neurons in the gut as there is the brain. There's as many neurons in your gut as the as there is in your dog's brain. So your gut is as intelligent as your dog, you know, right? Um, and they're just now starting to discover like the, the power of the gut, how the the second brain and your first brain speak and communicate together and even shit like parkinson's disease they're saying is now stem from the gut not not from the brain um you know but yeah take care of that gut biome man so you know when you ask about supplementation again i'm a freak with this stuff i work with an optimal health physician i get my blood work done every single 90 days um we reassess analyze everything if you go into my cupboard right now it looks like a freaking you know mini pharmacy um but i'm very very intentional with it Okay, so, okay, so, so let me do seven days of cardio. Yeah. You know, work out with weights three days a week. Correct. Yep. And then, and then, and then three days a week, you you don't work out with the weights. You still do the cardio and you fast. So yep. when you fast, are you eating? Do you do it like? I mean, do you eat anything that day, or you just? So I might food? have my last meal like eight o'clock the night before, um, and then my next meal might be you know five or six o'clock the next night for dinner. And I'll have two meals that day. Um, so I fast every Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and um, yeah, and then cardio is, you know, great to be done in a fasted state anyway. Um, I mean, like a big mistake I see people that make that go to the gym, they do their cardio first, you know, right? And then they'll go hit resistance training. Well, you got to understand that you're when, you're when you're working out with weights, your body uses muscle glycogen for fuel, right? Well, when you go to cardio, if that muscle glycogen hasn't been burnt yet, you have to burn through the muscle glycogen before you go into a fat burning state. Right. So if you do cardio before you go hit the weights, you've, you've exhausted all your your muscle glycogen stores. So then when I go work out weights, I have nothing to fuel my muscles. So my muscle get, uh, or my body will become catabolic and start burning muscle tissue and using that for fuel. So it totally contradicts itself. Right. So uh, if I'm doing cardio, it's either post workout or, or empty stomach first thing in the morning. I actually have a treadmill at home where I do my cardio. And when I do cardio, dude, it's just a, uh, uh, you know, I'm not running. It's just a, uh, you know, a, a fast walk on an incline for 20 minutes a day. That's all I do. J just cardio, dude. There's very little fat burning, you know, benefits from cardio. You are gonna, you're gonna go out there and burn so much more fat from resistance training. You know, and of course, diets. You know, diets 85, 90 percent of it. Um, I just strictly do cardio for heart health. That's it. So you'll eat at eight o'clock the night before. And then you won't eat anything till about five thirty the next day. Yeah, we have five thirty six. We usually have dinner in my house around six thirty with family. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, dude, that's that's interesting. Let's yep. see here if we got any questions on Instagram, Facebook. Let me know if you guys have any questions. We're getting close to the end of this thing. Got about ten minutes left. So, okay, bro, I'm a new agent. All right, brand new. I'm in this new technology world. I want to. I want to be the next big thing. What What do I do? All right. So, um, get a database. Right. Um, not saying that you gotta get mine. I also happen to own, a, be an owner in a software company that we have uh, front end websites and back end, uh, back end CRM. Where we teach you all the stuff. Teach you how to Facebook lead generate all of that. But regardless of the system that you need. Like you need to have a good website that's effective for lead generation, which means force registrations. You can install Facebook Pixel, um, um, a good CRM. If you're going to do Facebook ads, something that integrates with Zapier, and, and so you can do lead ads, which are just the most, by far the most effective thing you can do in real estate right now. Um, so, you, so you you need a website and a CRM, right? Um, then from there, you know, like believe it or not, as much as I'm killing with open or with Facebook ads, open houses are still by far the majority of my business. Forty eight percent of my business comes from open houses. If I could only do one thing, if I had to choose one thing, like let's say I lost it all, moved to, I don't know, Texas, and I start my real estate business all over again, you know, dude, I could only pick one thing, it'd just be open houses, right? I mean, they are the quickest way to now money that exists out there, but I need that CRM so I can follow up effectively, right? Most real estate agents vastly overestimate the amount of lead, leads that they need, but vastly underestimate the amount of follow-up that it takes. So like when I get an open house lead, they come into my database, I have a thousand day automated uh, email and text strip campaign they go on. Um, and then they're gonna get a total of seven calls in the first 14 days, a call every 21 days after that up to, to the first year until uh, communication has been established, their time frame has been established, then the, the default protocol adjusts based on that. Um, but our average lead, dude, it's 36 reach outs right now and six conversations 
with the average lead before we get that that appointment. So it's it's a lot of frequency with that. Okay, good stuff. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan with open houses too. You know, to get now business. I think you're right there. Let's see. Have you ever heard of this? Have you ever heard of this uh, uh, Zoom? What are your thoughts on Zoom and the business yeah. model? Of paying a buyer paying five percent premium and the seller only pays one percent. You ever heard of that? I haven't. I mean, there's so many damn different platforms that pop up daily. I'll look into them after seeing this, but I I, I can't really speak yeah. to them. A couple of people mentioned it. I haven't heard of it either. So Rich says perfectstorm dot dot uh, perfectstormnow dot com best CRM website there is. Now I've actually heard this from a couple of different agents that that they're using Perfect Storm and they say it is like legit. Yeah, yeah. We went out there, so like and this all happened from the boot camp. Um, but I had all these agents that were reaching out to me like, Josh, you know, I want to use something like you have, but I can't afford you know the boom town of the world that's fifteen hundred dollars a month. And I tried to find a solution for them, and there's just nothing that was effective that was affordable. And uh, so we wanted to create like the affordable you know, version of Boomtown. Now, hopefully, you know, we're working on it and it's, it, we, you know, I feel it's better than Boomtown at this point, um, but I'm biased, you know, right? So you got to make your own judgment up on that. You know, but yeah, dude, we're $199 a month and and that's our whole goal is the most effective but affordable website serum platform out there for agents. You know, we just actually, yesterday, we just released um, our video email platform. So agents that love Bomb Bomb or been using a platform like that, that's built into ours now. So you don't have to, you know, all that's, now we didn't integrate Bomb Bomb. We created our own. We don't do any integrations, but um, you know, all all of that it's plug and play system for sure. What's the what's the price of Perfect Storm? Uh, One hundred ninety nine dollars a month. So I'll give you guys a promo code uh, if you go to perfectstormnow.com. You got to do. We sell the front end website only for those that have a CRM, but nobody, in my opinion, that's the shitty way to go. Like you got to get the website and the CRM. And the cool thing on the CRM is. All my personal drips are preloaded in there. So everything I do in my business, everything in there is all preloaded in there. Um, so you have access to those instantaneously. But that's $199 a month. But if you use promo code save money now, you can save 300 bucks. So you save the, the $200 registration fee and then we give you 50% off the first month. All right, John wants to know, how do you manage your other business ventures and keep everything in line? I've got two other businesses and struggle with managing slash running them all. Yeah, that's an awesome question, John. So um, I do not start another business. So I didn't start my, my second business until I was in real estate for about seven or eight years, right? So you got to understand I had my team in place. I was able to step away and give that time and that attention. So um, unless they're synergistic. Like right now, uh, um, you know, I just signed the operations agreement and I'm uh, starting my own title company, right? Well, that's a synergistic company to my real estate company that isn't going to take much of my time and energy to go out there and do. Um, but outside of that, like if I'm starting a, another venture, like I'm, uh, I'm going to get all the operations, I'm going to get this business automated, delegated, put a team together. And before I step into the next venture, Right. Um, um, I'm going to make sure that that's set so then I can step away. Cause yeah, otherwise you, you just dilute focus. Right. And, and you just get a bunch of shit done. That's half ass. Right. So, um, you know, that's the reason I was able to go out there and do the boot camp, do these other things is because I spent seven, eight years developing such a great real estate team. Where I was able to step out of production and have it operate without my day to day involvement. So I could give my 100% focus to other businesses. So yeah, I don't, I, I've learned this the hard way. So when I say I don't, I've done it many times. Where then you realize, dude, I, I bit off way more than I could chew. I, I'm way above my max capacity. So now that I'm very strict with it, I don't take on a venture unless I can give it the attention it needs, which means that my other businesses have to be automated and dialed in. So one at a time. Yep. Let's see. Okay, quick question about Perfect Storm. Is it does it come with the boot camp? No, it does not come with a boot camp. So two two totally different separate companies, um, businesses, but um you know, but it, it, in the boot camp, you don't have to, you know, and I'm very hardcore with this in the boot camp. I let everybody know that everything that's on the boot camp, I teach you to be successful with whatever system that you have, right? Um, you know, you learn a lot about Perfect Storm in there just because it's what I use. So when I'm showing examples of how I work my database, how I follow up with the stuff, you know, but I teach you how to also set your own database up and, and I give you all my drips so you can plug them into your own CRM, all of that, but two totally different separate companies. 
What do you think the number one right now? You're a guy, you know, you get a lot of you, you, your your uh, real estate business is automated. You know, you're doing a lot of Facebook, you know, leads, all that stuff. What do you think the number one reason why a prospect chooses a real estate agent? Um, I mean, so their their human psychology is that there's only three reasons that people do business with you. One, because they like you. Two, because they trust you. Number three, because you do a good job. Yeah, right. So, I mean, to me, doing a good job is the ante. Like, you, you got to be good at what you do and good at your craft. You know, outside of that, man, it's just down to that human connection. Who's got the best follow-up strategy that can be first, right? And and understanding human behaviors. Like, when I set an appointment, like inside my real estate business, like I know no buyer wants to fucking meet with a real estate agent. They just want to go out there and see a house, right? Or or a mm-hmm. seller doesn't. You know, they just want the information that they want to make the best decision for themselves, their family. Um, and then we'll let you know when they're ready, right? So we've got to just understand how the human mind works today and if we just pay attention to ourselves like you go into macy's at the mall first thing that the salesperson says is okay oh, i help you find something They're like no no I don't. i'm just looking you're not just looking we're busy as hell you just drove 20 minutes long you're not there to just freaking look you're there to buy some shit but it's like hey leave me alone let me go out there and do my own due diligence when i'm freaking ready when i need you i'll let you know then you're of service to me right mm-hmm. so um we're just hardcore with understanding human behavior and and yeah mimicking that in a real estate business. So when I'm having a conversation with somebody, man, I'm focusing always on the human connection. I'm not trying to sell them. I'm not trying to be salesy. Focus on the human connection, right? One of the best books you can ever read is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Be interested, not interesting. Um, and then I'm doing everything I can to deliver a way for them to get the information they want without being sold. So it's, you know, we implement a very strict, absolute no pressure policy. So it's like, hey, Risky, or hey, hey Ricky, the next best step is set time where we can meet, you know, discuss the overall process. My commission is free to you when, when you purchase the home. The seller actually pays my commission. You know, I look out, I'm here to look out for your best interests and, you know, my fiduciary duty is to you. Um, so my services are free to you. However, you do have a monetary investment into the transaction. For example, inspections, appraisals, there's areas that you're at risk, areas that you're protected. So the sole purpose of this meeting is to educate you on the process. So you can make the best decision for yourself and for your family. And sometimes some of our, our, our uh, potential clients decide home ownership isn't for them or right now is not the time for you. And that's OK. Just so you know, there's no obligation, no hassle. And we have a very, very strict, absolute no pressure policy inside our organization. So you'll never be pressured. You'll never be sold. You'll never be hassled. Right. We're just here to deliver the information that you need to make the best decision, whatever that decision may be. Now, I've got three o'clock or seven o'clock available tomorrow. Which one of those times works best for you? So it's just getting deep into, again, the consumer's mindset, and getting what they want. But in order to do that and have those conversations, yeah, you got to follow up like a mofo, you know, right? Yeah, That's just how yeah. it goes. Sure, sure, yeah. Human communication, human connection, follow up, follow up communication, communication, so on and so forth. Okay, bro, last little question here. Say I'm an agent, I'm six months to a year in the business, I'm on the cusp. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I made a couple sales. I'm kind of, I'm treading water. I've tried a bunch of things. I can't get can't get my feet under me. I can't get any momentum going in the business. What do you, what, what's your advice? Get a mentor. I mean, it's just, it's just that simple, right? Now I get, okay, maybe you can't afford a mentor. You can't maybe afford to jump into Ricky's, you know, coaching program or whatever. Like you, you might be in debt and you're, you're not knowing how you're going to pay rent next month. Just, you know, if you can't get a mentor to, that you're paying them, um, go out there and find a mentor, right? Whether that means you join their team, Right, which is which is what most new real estate agents need to freaking do is just join a damn team and learn the right path. I'm not saying that just because I'm a team leader, but you're gonna learn the right structure. You know, like if you join my team, dude, it's a plug and play system. You tell me exactly what you want to make. There's no guesswork. Here's the plan. Here's what you do. Here's all the tools, resources they need to make it happen. You got to put in the work, right? And people still can fail at that, but if you're committed, you're gonna do the work. Um, or right, if you don't want to join a team, you could still go out there and get a mentor. And you might have to trade your time for their time. Yeah, right. You might have to, to be an assistant to them for free for 10 hours a week to get two or, or three hours of their time back a week. But find somebody in your area that's created the success that you want to create. Figure out a way to get them as a mentor. Success leaves clues. Right. And and, and it, it just drives me nuts that, that so many people don't go out there and seek mentors, man. And there's so yeah. many different ways to do it. It doesn't have to cost you money, you know, yeah. uh, but get a freaking mentor. Yeah. I mean, you know, Agents like successful agents like me or you, like some anybody can come and ask me any question they want anytime, man. I'm, I'm always open to answer anything or tell anybody anything they want to know. I think a lot of agents are scared to ask questions to they're intimidated or whatever, and they just need to get over that and uh, 
you know, ask questions and get a mentor. Like you say, dude, one of the hardest core people I know, GSD, good shit done, man. I appreciate you coming on, man, and, and just expressing yourself with all this stuff and sharing a lot of your ideas and philosophy and stuff, man. Yeah, that's been a lot of fun, man. It's been an honor. It's always, it's always awesome rapping with you, bro. Sure, sure. Guys, that's it for today. Um, appreciate you guys watching. If you guys need to reach out to me or Josh, you guys know how to find us. Um, we'll talk to you guys soon. And uh, you guys have a good rest of the day. Appreciate you guys watching.